Now on this video, we're going to try to answer some basic 101 questions that people have sent in regarding our channel, and I think the information will be useful to everybody. Now today's the day I waited for for a long time. I had this idea in my mind for a long time to do answer the questions that come in on my channel on YouTube and try to reply to them on video. And it was a, a haphazard thing I had done in the past from here and there and everywhere. But today I wanted to make a dedicated, this will be the first video, the intro video. And if it's successful and if you like it, let me know and I'll do more. But the idea is to share information. Now in the past what had happened, and this happens all the time, you, you would get a question for a, my paint isn't sticking to the part or I'm having orange peel or I'm having how do you set a spray gun and I'd answer it and what would happen is two weeks later same question two weeks later well not everybody watches the video at the same time or I'm gonna to try to share on this video some useful information the whole purpose of our channel is to share useful information among the people that have a passion for motorcycling so we have to start somewhere. Well, now when I go to a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, first thing I want to do is I'm talking to a guy who's going to help me or teach me. I want to know something. Does, does he know what he's talking about? Mm. So what happens if you're a lawyer, you hang up all these things on a, behind your desk. If you're a doctor, you have these, these photos that show you're the doctor of the year and dentist of the year or whatever. But, but if you do what I do, you need a resume. Well, the resume is in this garage. And, and I'm self-taught, I've never gone to painting school, never gone to mechanic school, never gone to, maybe never even gone to kindergarten, I don't know yet. Maybe they'll find that out if they research, research me out. But, but here's the thing, I've been able to, because I'm self-taught, learn things that maybe a lot of much more educated people, if you go to painting school, an example is, if they never teach you how to paint when it's 28 degrees and it's snowing out. Well. I figured out how to do it. Just go back and look at some of the videos and you'll see that. So the information that I'm trying to pass on is not super highly educated things that you'd have to know if you went to Harvard. These are things you're an average person with an average amount of money, average amount of talent. I think we're all in that league. And you live, you live in an average, you don't live on a yacht or something. So, so you're able to, and you like to maximize your enjoyment of motorcycling by customizing it, maintaining it, Maybe, maybe learning how to do track days or ride safely without, without doing, uh, making the mistakes that a lot of my friends have made some serious mistakes that uh, yeah, cost you tickets, in some cases cost you a trip to the hospital or worse. But anyway, again, it's, it's, this is the first one we're doing like this. I've been saving the, 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 the questions that come in. I'll just use people's first name so that they, if they're embarrassed or something. But if you want me to use your real name, say, hey, use my name. Give me, it's okay too. All we're trying to do is share useful information. And in my case, because I've taken so much from YouTube, I've learned how to fix my ice maker. I've learned how to do this, that, or the other thing. And even parts of my water heater and furnace that I've been able to do because I look on YouTube and I see, I don't need a mechanic. I don't need to pay a guy $300, come to the house so we can take the filter out of my furnace. These are the kind of things we're trying to share. It's, I call it, for lack of a better word, useful information. Mostly about motorcycles, mostly about painting, carbon fiber, and maybe just common sense in general. So for anybody new to the channel, my motorcycle collection is nine motorcycles, seven are registered with titles and insured for year-round riding, but they're an eclectic group. Each one is unique, each one is different, each one I've done significant amount of work customizing it and making it my own. And that's some of the information we've been able to share on our channel. Whether you like 70s bikes, 80s bikes, 90s bikes, modern bikes, sport bikes, dirt bikes. I don't have any more dirt bikes, I had many. But it's an eclectic view of motorcycling and the truth is we love them all. And I've done many of these restorations on a shoestring, very little money, the cost of the paint and a ton of labor. And in, along the way, I've learned a lot of significant things that are worth passing on if you're in the same boat I am. And a nice thing about what I do and the things I share, none of them are high dollar. We start with very inexpensive motorcycles and we start with a lot of labor and a lot of good fun along the way. 
and usually we wind up with, <laughs> I don't know if, if other people enjoy them, but I enjoy riding all of these motorcycles. Now the R1, in 2009 I bought the R1, and I was so happy when I bought this bike, but it didn't take me long to want to make it my own, and within a year I had made seats for it and made handlebar risers and all kind of things, and the thing is, what I've done, all of that stuff is in the ch on the channel for people that want to look at it. Had I not recorded it, it'd be lost forever. This restoration took 500 hours roughly. Every step of it is on the channel, and I'm going to show later on how you can dig into that channel of about 2,500 videos now. You can dig into the channel and find exactly what you want to know very easily. And last, the last part of my resume, this is the bike we're working on now. And with the help of a lot of friends and a lot of input from Karen, a lot of input from John Pothia, I've managed to make it my own. And I think the summer coming up, when I ride the bike, it's going to be my bike. I, I'm going to feel a bond with the bike after all the hours I spent working on it. Now let's get down to the cellar. I start answering some questions. So what I did for the last week and a half, I've been saving the questions that came in, comments, and I looked up some of the older videos because I remember some comments that I thought were worth answering, and I'm going to try to do this methodically. I'm going to try to do the, the ones I think have the most impact first. And the first one I wanted to address, and I thought this was something everybody in the world that ever painted something ran into this problem. You, you go down and you do a beautiful custom paint job, and you pull the tape up, and the paint pulls up off the part. Now, I want to show some of the things you can do, or what you should do, to make that not happen. The biggest reason that would ever happen is because the paint is not sticking to the part. The paint will not stick to the part if the part's greasy, it's dirty, or it's smooth. Now, if I were to just, as an example, this is a spare evil twin windshield for the MT-09. If I were to just paint this, that paint has a surface area of, it's flat. If I scuff it up with steel wool, 400 sand, 400 sandpaper, by the way, is choice one. Now the surface is up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. In between the scratches, it gets a tooth. And it's that tooth that allows it to stick real well. Now that's the primer sticking to the original part. Getting it clean and getting a tooth in it with at least 400, maybe even 320. Getting that tooth in the part. That's tip one, painting 101. And Scott, Thank you for sharing this question. This is something that I've answered a hundred times already, and, and I'm, now I'll be able to answer it to, to 10,000 potential people in one shot. So now you have the part primed. You go to paint your whatever trim, paint, whatever. Now to get the paint to stick to the primer, pretty easy. A lot of people will just paint right over the primer, and that seems to work pretty well. A lot of people don't let the primer dry long enough, or they let it dry for 10 years. Either way, it's not a real good idea. Read what it says on the can. Some primers are made that 10 minutes later you can paint. Some, like the one I use, better for about 45 minutes to an hour. But everything involving paint, no matter what you read on a can or what you read, or, it assumes your temperature is 70 to 72 degrees and your humidity is low. So a lot of times when you have shop conditions, I have a damp, cold cellar and I'm painting when it's snowing, these things all change. And that's in the details of doing it, that's what I've put on many, many, many videos that go into extreme detail on how to do that. Now, even to laying out the stripes and how to lay them out with the minimum of back masking, all that information is on my channel. So now you have the part, and I just want to make an example. Up, The colored paint is on, you've laid out the stripe, you go to pull up the tape, zip, and up comes the paint. Now, you look at the paint that came up, where did it delaminate? Did it pull off of the bare part. If that's the case, the primer didn't stick. If you're pulling it off the primer, maybe you got to sand that primer with 400. Any combination of that. If you're pulling up the tape and all that's coming up is the paint that's on the colored paint, that's the area that you're having a problem with. So it's a very involved thing. And later in the video, I'm going to show how to research this out on my channel very, very conveniently. But the rough detailing on it is Paint makes a bond mechanically. It does this in sanding scratches. It's a mechanical bond. It also does a chemical bond. So you have thinner in the paint. It's the thinner. It's coming into the paint, and it melts some of the paint, and it grabs. That's how it works. 
So what happens when you use fast, dry, and thinner? It does this, and it goes, oh, I think I'll get a little, Ugh. and medium, mid-temp, it gets a nice bond. Slow drying, which is usually what we used to use in clear on when you did acrylic lacquer and things, it gets a tremendous bond, but it tends to melt. So if you had a stripe, you might even melt that. Mm, I don't know. Mid-temp is always my first choice. So Scott, I, I hope I've answered that question. I've answered it personally many times to other people. Now I hope I've answered it to whoever looks at this video, even in the years to come. Okay, the next question is from Jeremy. And Jeremy, this is, this is something I just addressed not long ago. I don't remember on which restoration it was because I had the problem. On, and what his question is, is should I sand the color before I put the clear on? Now, in some cases, maybe the answer is yes. If you do black, white, maybe even some reds and blues. But metallics, metallics are a different thing. Silver is death. If you sand silver, it's almost guaranteed you're going to spray the clear. Unless it's really, really wet and it melts it, you're going to see the scratches. So my suggestion is, is when you put on anything silver, Put on a coat of clear first, and if you still have to sand it, sand the clear, not the silver, the gold, or the metallic color. And that, that Jeremy, is really useful information. And I'm going to try to link into some of these other videos that, that go into that in detail if I can find them. But again, there's, there's almost 2,500 videos, so sometimes that answer is buried, and even I forget where it is. But I'm going to show how to find it later on in the video. So, Jeremy, I hope that information was useful. Now, I was looking through my videos here, and I wanted to find some information about fixing fairings with CA, but I didn't want to forget to thank the three people that had sent in that they watched the thing I said about the small blinkers, and one of the guys said something that I thought was worth adding. He said, I never even thought about that. I'm a new rider. Well, I, I always, I always, maybe I always forget the fact a lot of people that are new to this don't think these things through until some car goes by them that the guy is texting and uh, whatever. And it can be dangerous. That's already on the video. Okay, the next question is from Mike G. This, this came just this morning. And he was looking to change the plugs in his R1. <clears throat> and I have a video of, of when I did mine. And... He couldn't find the video. He found part two and three, but not part one or, or the reverse of that. I don't remember. I just took sh quick notes. So, again, later on in the video, I'm going to show how to do that. But I want to get to the question, the meat and potatoes first here. So what I, what I had suggested to him is you type in, again, my name in quotation marks and R1 starter. If that doesn't bring up the video, R1 plugs, R1 maintenance. You need a keyword that's going to find that video for you. Because, again, when I title a video, I might have titled that video uh, changing a fuel injection or something. I don't know. But, again, I'm going to show that in, in detail. And John Pothia showed me how to do that, and it works almost every time. A few times, the keyword I put in was not... I try to put a keyword in there so it's easy to find. But, again, when you're looking for that kind of information, and I've looked for the thing for my ice maker on YouTube... And I had a, I don't remember the brand of the refrigerator. And I looked it up and up came a different brand. And, and I thought, oh man, I'm in trouble. Then I looked and the ice makers were all very similar. So I said, oh, okay. And I looked further down the list and like maybe 15 down, there's my refrigerator, the old antique and, and the ice makers are available. <laughs> there you go. But YouTube is very, very useful, but you got to know how to search it. We're going to talk about that later. But Mike, I hope you're able to find it, and if not, in the worst possible world, I'll do a little try to do a search for you and pass that information on. Now, whenever I do a repair using CA, and I've got many, many videos on how to do it, I won't get into that right now. But what I always like is the comments. People have been able to do it. Here's crash damage on, on one of Vlad's bikes. And to make that look like it's brand new, I have been meticulous about getting every step of it on the channel. So some of the information that I've, I've gathered, more information from YouTube, I think, than, than most people. And a, a really useful idea. Kevin sent this in. He watched a video about me cutting a windshield up recently. And he said the, the blade was melting the material as it went through. So his idea was try water cooling the blade. Well, I, again, I don't know that that's going to work, but the next time I cut one, I'll try even, 
another choice is, and I don't know if this is the right way to do it. Maybe somebody else has more experience. Because I know Dave Midgley did a lot of vacuum forming at one time, and we vacuum formed the, ca the canopies for airplanes and stuff. So the, the answer was maybe not water, maybe lubricant for the blade. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe they make a lubricant for that, like they do a cutting oil or something. I don't know, but I appreciate when people try to pass on information to me. And Kevin, we will definitely try that next time we cut a windshield. Thank you for submitting that. And I, you now have passed it on to whoever subscribes or looks at the video in the future. And I think we have about 10,000 and a half subscribers. So maybe, maybe two or three of them are watching this video. Who knows? Now, another tip worth passing on. You can see in many of the things in the older videos, I was painting without wearing a mask because I was talking while I was shooting a video. Now, and of course, I don't suggest anybody paint without, especially two, the uh, two-part, but what I do now is I wear the mask and then put the voice over later. It's an upgrade for me. These questions all came in within one week, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to sort them out, but th this is from Brett. Now, Brett, this is a question I wish I had the answer. I might have the answer and not know it. He's asking, how do you deal with the ethanol and fuel when you run your bikes and then blah, 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 that, that it gums up the carburetors. Well, mine don't seem to gum up as much as most people. There's a reason. I typically, and I've even put this on the video, I typically go out to the, the when it's above freezing, of course, or if I get a warm day and I can't ride, I'll pull all the bikes out of the garage. I videotaped even. Run them all till they come up to temperature. Let them even run another five minutes. What it does, it does two things. It gets the oil circulating and burns up all the residual moisture out of the exhaust, number one. The little Viton tips, if it's a carbureted bike, and I don't know about fuel injection, but the carbureted bikes have these little needles shut off the fuel, Viton tips. And all carburetors, all carburetors have a vent. They're not sealed. There's a vent somewhere in that car, all McCooney carburetors anyway. So what happens is eventually, if you leave a bike long enough, the fuel evaporates out of the carburetor and whatever's there's water in fuel. <laughs> Whatever goop is in there winds up at the bottom. If you have that little fillet drain like on a Makuni, some of the Makunis anyway, the ones I put on the uh, RD, they have that little thing you can just screw the bottom out and drain it. Now, I, this is the reason I think this is an interesting question. I have friends that run the bike dry and let the carburetor sit dry. I don't know if that works because I don't do it. And I can't pass information on that I don't really know. But I did own an airplane for seven years. I owned a 1947 Air Coupe, and we had, we had five partners in a plane, and we would each take rotating Fridays. And on Friday after work, one of us, even if you didn't fly the plane, went down, propped the plane, let it run up to temperature, and there was the, the aviation part of it. I'll bet you Dallas knows. He might want to share some of that with us because aviation oil is different than regular oil and there's reasons you want to get the moisture out and you want to do this and that and the other thing but but the bottom line is it worked so because I haven't had any problems I kind of can suggest every once in a while run your bike the worst thing you can do for a bike the worst thing is put it aside and just leave it if you push it around you move it around, ride it up and down the driveway. If it's too cold to go for a real ride, ride it around a block. Keep everything moving. The worst thing for a bike is to store it. Now, one of the things a lot of people might not realize, is my career in model aviation spans over 50 years, and I developed a lot of carbon fiber materials and parts and things that they made for model planes, the propellers, for instance, carbon fiber fuel tanks, I did all that development work while I was a modeler, and I can pass that information on now through our video. So next question is, and this is, so many people have sent this question, and I, I've answered it on video, but I'm going to try to find some videos to reference to show the link. They, you buy a sport bike, I don't care what, it's an R6 or a Bomoda or a MV Agusta, it doesn't matter. Sport bikes are made to be lightweight. They have these shells of fairings that are usually held on by you know, the tiniest little Zeus fittings or little points. And where that bolt is, is called, in engineering terms, a stress riser. So it vibrates, 
And where it can't vibrate and where it vibrates, where it comes together is called a stress riser. In aviation and in, in life it is. So what happens is it breaks. Now for Vlad and for Glenn and for my own, it uh, doesn't matter. It, we're just using an example. Anytime you have that, that you start to see a crack in the paint, stop. Take the fairing off and put some carbon fiber and epoxy on the back of it. You can buy carbon fiber and five minute epoxy off the internet a small amount relatively cheaply. And if you use the technique I show on the videos, you, you can do this repair in a matter of half an hour, 45 minutes. I remember Vlad had an accident with his bike. I, I don't remember which bike it was even. And he came over here with a fairing that had six or eight things needed to be reattached and carbon fibered up. And while we were sitting and, you know, just talking for an hour or two, I got all the mechanical stuff done so he could go back to a track day and ride the bike. Then he could bring the part over and when he's not going to a track day and I can do all the cosmetic stuff. But the mechanical things to fix it. A repair is always a mechanical fix. Now it's fixed. It isn't broken. And then you do that cosmetic thing that looks like it's never been broken. And that, that cosmetic thing, that a mechanical thing I'm good at because I'm a self-taught engineer. So, but the, 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 the part of it to make it look like it's never been broken, that's on many, many of the videos. And that's an art unto itself that I have not seen a lot of people share on YouTube. Maybe there's not a lot of people that do it. They just buy new fairings. But in a case of, say, you have Vlad's Momoda or, or the Mondial, you can't go buy a part. It, their parts don't exist. So you gotta, you gotta be able to do that. And that's, that's an excellent question. We're gonna show some of that somewhere on here. And in fact, and in fact, I gotta look through my notes here. Somebody, and I, maybe I didn't write it down. Yeah, maybe, I, maybe I should be writing more stuff down. Somebody just wrote me a thing and, and they'll know who they are. Uh, they've been watching the videos for four years and they've been able, they're a backyard mechanic like I am. They've been able to do a really nice paint job and just watch from the information on the videos. Now, the good thing about the information on the videos, like we all love, it's free. <laughs> so it's hard to be mad at something if it's free. Now, I try my best, but I'm not perfect. I leave out steps. And over the years, I've heard people tell me, you left out a step, you left out, yeah, what, what, what grade of sandpaper? So my videos tend to get longer and longer. And then I have somebody like I had last week, somebody tell me, oh, I wasted my time watching your video. I could have done that in one minute. Well, it took me a minute to read his comment. Is that a wasted minute? Eh, I don't know. But, but I really don't want to get into arguing about things. It's pointless. In the world of motorcycles, you ride the, Joe Roselli gets the credit for this. You ride the bike that you like. Another guy's riding a different bike. Another guy's riding a track bike. You're riding a dirt bike. He's riding something else. You want a shiny bike. He wants a rusty bike. We can all be friends. That's the bottom line. Now here I'm working on Vlad's Momoda, Momoda, and those parts are not available. And even if they were, you'd have to uh, give them a car in return for a fairing. Anyway, the, the my whole point is doing being able to do a carbon fiber repair. And keep in mind, the older the bike is, the more prone it is to break, especially when these parts are made out of plastic. And being able to repair it, or at least being able to look at a video here, we're doing a carbon fiber repair, and then that's the easy part, getting it mechanically fixed. Doing a cosmetic part is a real, real challenge, and it's on the video. And I always think the best of all worlds is to share stories of your life. I use the videos to share stories of what my life has evolved into, how it, how it became what it is, and, and a lot of people don't know this, and I'll share it. And, and a lot of people are going to say, oh, pfft. well, it was 1987. Now, and probably a lot of people watching this were not alive yet. 1987, I was at the National Model Airplane Championships in Lincoln, Nebraska, and had crashed my plane. When I crashed it, I was on the runway, and I got some CA, and I got some balsa wood, and I had a couple other people helping me, and... Uh, I was re repairing it, and a guy named Ken Budenson came by with a, a video camera that was as big as a van and said, do you mind if I take video of you repairing a plane? I said, Ken, sure, no problem. Well, in the course of doing it, maybe over an hour, he had shot video, and at the end of it, I, we went and had a hamburger together, and he said, that's amazing that you can fix that stuff. I don't know how, uh, nobody else can do it, uh, whatever. He was impressed. So, and I said, well, you know what? 
if you give me the camera, I was kidding around, of course, if you give me the camera, when I go back home, every time I fix something, I'll take a video, and these are VHS tapes, and I'll mail it to you. Well, what happened is he did give me a video camera. <laughs> so it was put up or shut up. And I made this first set of videos I ever made, a set of eight videos of how to build a model plane called a Nobler. Now, that, in 1987, was groundbreaking stuff. A lot of people, oh, where is that going to go? Well, 25 years later, I was still making videos of model airplanes, which now has morphed into I've retired from model airplanes and gotten into motorcycles, and, and I've continued that video-making thing. So now John Pothier had this great idea, and John and I have been friends forever since there were dinosaurs on the earth. John had an idea. He says, why don't you post these videos on YouTube so other people can see them? What a great idea. But, except I didn't know how to do YouTube. Now, I, I was shooting video before there was YouTube, before there even was a YouTube. So I, with John's help, and I, we, we figured out what would be an appropriate way of doing this, and John did a lot of the research, and he figured this out, that YouTube had an editing program, and because I have no computer skills, I went into the editing program early in the morning, and I said, yeah, I'll figure this out. I'm very confident about it, and without, with no computer skills, and, and I, I couldn't get it to work at all. I was really frustrated, so I asked my daughter, who's a professional video editor, this is what she did for a living, Stacy, can you come over to the house and give me a quick lesson, and she says, oh, Wendy, it's so complicated, you'll never figure it out. You'll never, it's, it's impossible, I can't help you, it's just too involved. I said, okay. So I came back to the thing, and I got a big cup of coffee, and I said, I will not go to sleep tonight until I have an edited YouTube video. And I learned, self-taught again, over the course of probably 12 hours, how to edit, and, and how to put the titles in, and how to do all the, the magic stuff with the screen changes and everything. And what happened is, it was late at night, I emailed her that video, and she couldn't believe it. Even up to today, we talk over the family table, about that was the original first video. <laughs> and in one day I figured out. So what's the point of the story? Yeah, I don't need a pat on the back, neither do you. We're both cool people. So here's what's gotta happen. If you, ha if you have any inclination at all, and you have any computer skills, well, your skills have to be better than mine, shoot some video, share it with us. I'll put it on the channel. Figure a way to get it to me. I'll figure out with John Pothia's help how to download it and do everything. If you're working on a bike, I've encouraged people, send me the video, send me the, the, the link and whatever. If, if you look in YouTube, you can see how many people have, <laughs> they're doing exactly what I'm doing. There's funny dog videos, they send in their dog. Well, in the world of motorcycling, we all love to look at motorcycle pictures. It's, it's a, and it's free, that's the best part. And, and if you don't like it, you know, you don't have to, you can look at other people's videos, but it's fun to do video, and that's something I wanted to pass on. But now, this is the meat and potatoes of this video. So this is what I wanted to share. You have your computer on. I assume you have a computer or a phone or whatever, however you access YouTube. And it's very easy. In my case, I have Firefox, but it doesn't really matter. And I go to YouTube. And, of course, YouTube comes right up. Once I'm in YouTube, and once I can access YouTube and I have the screen where I can search. I want to search with my name. Now I've already done this already so I can just put it on. It says, and I'll put this up on a screen, Wendy Ertnowski fairing repairs. So if my name in quotation marks and the word fairing repair and look what comes up. Suzuki repair, Bomoda repair, Honda repair, uh, Ducati repair, another Ducati, another Ducati. Well we fixed a lot of Ducatis. Honda repair, uh, Baba ba, ba Ninja Repair. So these videos all show in detail what's available, and this is already on my channel. It's already out there. It's already posted. Now some of them get lengthy because I try not to leave out the steps, especially Vlad's. This is what he dumped his Suzuki. <laughs> and we, he wanted to go to a track day, I don't know, at a weekend or something, and he called in a favor now because he's in the you know, the Windy Mafia here. We, we got this ready for him for the next track day. So anyway, all these videos are out there. All you got to do is key that in. Or if you search and, and it doesn't say fairing repair, if you put in painting fairings or you put in carbon fiber or whatever, spark plugs, starter repair. And if it's not out there, I, 
you got to try a different keyword and take, because it is all out there. Everything I've, my life is out there. Now, a lot of things that's on our channel, and like the repairing of Joe Padula's 888 Ducati. This is, these are not bikes that you can just go buy, just call up a partzilla and get the parts. The other thing is, in Joe's case, he had to get the decals from Australia. So, when you're working on somebody's bike that's a collector bike, and you can't get the parts, and the parts are hard to get, and they're very expensive, and you do this kind of a repair, you had better know that you're not going to destroy the part or make a mess out of it or something. So, Vlad's Bomoda, another bike we did a lot of work on. It needed a lot of tabs repaired, parts of the fairing created with CA. All of that stuff is on our channel. And a lot of this stuff, and I don't know how much, uh, is this no place else on YouTube I've ever seen it. And so, it's hard to find that information. That's why I think the channel that I've created is a resource for a lot of reasons. People that have these older bikes and collector bikes, or in the case of some people, they just want to do the work themselves. They want to know how to do it. They want to paint their own bike. If Stephen Walker in Australia wanted to paint his own bike. He, and he did. And he had a couple of little issues with the runs in the wheels or something, but he saw I had the same issues too. So these are things we share. And being able to share a skill like I have is, is a wonderful thing for me because I'm so happy when I hear that somebody else got to paint or repair or do something to their bike. Yes, the late Alan Albert's bike, the, the track bike he had that was a one-of-a-kind Honda that Kenny Augustine worked on. The, re, bringing these parts back to life, Rip's bike, that bike, you know, to some people they would say, oh, well, I want to just buy a new fairing. Well, you know, for a lot of people, they, they just don't, they can't find it, or they don't have it, or they, they don't have the money to spend, or even if they have the money, they don't want to spend it. A Bomoda, if Vlad's Bomoda, the work I did on his Bomoda, and that included every step from the decals to the clear, to the matching the black, to the every step of it. And these repairs, the whole thing with doing these repairs is they better not break again, because you've got to go back right to the square one and do the whole thing over again if you don't get it right the first time. Very important to get it right the first time. So what I do think, and I really believe it in my heart of hearts, that these things are what enable us who have an appreciation or an enjoyment of motorcycling to share and to keep some of these older bikes alive, some of these collector bikes. Uh, Dale has a lot of collector bikes that when they need these little special repairs, we just did a Ducati repair for him, or Joe Padula's 888, some of Vlad's stuff, Vlad's an avid collector of these unobtainable bikes, Mondiales, and well, whatever. But now to me, the, the appreciation of it comes from not only being able to rescue and save these bikes, but once I put that on video, literally thousands of people can look at it. And people look at loot, at YouTube, I do, to be entertained. Yes, it may be entertaining. Some people would like to learn how to do some of this extensive work that we did. And some of this very high-tech stuff. Well, I try to do that too. Some people want to just share their love of motorcycling. Look at some pictures. Look at some uh, videos or whatever. People doing track days. People doing wheelies. People going to the Harley meetup and playing their radios loud. Whatever. It's a giant world of motorcycling, and no matter what part of it you enjoy, it's like going to a restaurant. You don't have to eat everything on a menu. You eat what you want on a menu. And I go back so many times to that famous thing, Joe Padula. Joe, Padula. <laughs> Joe Roselli said to me one time, we were arguing about bikes and talking about bikes, and he made the best statement, and I've already put it on the video. Ride the bike you like. It, once you have that concept in your mind, a lot of the other sense, when you go to a meetup and the guys are riding all different kind of sport bikes and Harleys and dirt bikes and on-road, off-road bikes and whatever, then you realize we're all part of a big family. And that big family includes everybody. It includes people that, that like to just look at motorcycles and don't even own one. Or 
people that want to bring back that most exotic rare bike that there's only three of in the country and and the problem with me is because I do a lot of this work for other people I appreciate them all and when I go to a bike meetup everybody that has an interest in motorcycling I like to consider everybody that we have something in common and we share so that's the first of the question and answer videos I'm gonna if this is a popular thing or if you have a question leave it in the comment section I'll try to be methodical about recording them and I've always thought if I answered questions one-on-one -on -one, and what used to happen years ago I'd get overwhelmed that I didn't have any time left over to shoot video and edit it and whatever so I think this is an efficient way of doing it and and I hope it works and I hope you enjoy it and I hope you learn from it and I hope you you will then when you learn it pass it on to your friends so thank you so much for watching So if it's the first time you've ever watched a windy video, there really are 2,500 videos out there. And basically, we try to post the video up every day if we can. In the summer, we try to post our rides, our meetups, our get-togethers, visiting people who have bike collections, people who have other interests in motorcycling, people that do restorations like Luciano, people like Turbo Steve that have very unusual, unique collections. Everybody, there's room in the sport. The sport is such a wonderful thing, such a diverse thing. And when we all get together, it's always worth sharing all of the meetups and whatever. So I do really do hope you enjoyed the video. And I hope in some way, you know, that we've shared the life and the passion we have for these old motorcycles. It is a wonderful, wonderful sport. And thanks again for watching.